everyone. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop. Today I have for you a conversation between Lisa Mason Ziegler and Jenny Love that was originally recorded for Jenny's No-Till Flowers Podcast. Jenny invited Lisa on the show to compare seed starting techniques and to discuss methods that provide superior seed germination and growing seedlings sustainably and regeneratively. Both Lisa and Jenny share lots of great resources and tips here. So listen in, and I hope you enjoy. Okay, I've got my dear friend, Lisa, with me today. We go way, 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 way back, way back. I don't even know how many years now, but Lisa Ziegler of the Gardener's Workshop has um, been in my in my hemisphere for a long time, so to speak, of people that I know and trust and consider a friend. And she's also a seed starting guru. So I thought, who better to have this conversation today with than Lisa, who knows heaps and heaps about seed starting and sells lots of seeds. So welcome, Lisa. I'm excited to chat with you. Hey, Jenny, my pleasure to be here and just love to be in your presence again. It's been a while for <laughs> it us. It has. We used to see each other all the time at ASCFG events um, as a board member and, and going to the events. Yeah. And then and then COVID happened and we're both not on the ASCFG board anymore. And now we, we don't see each other much. So it's always a delight. Yes, it is. Um just great to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation again. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I wanted to pick your brain about seed starting and then to have sort of this like, you know, volley back and forth about ideas about how to enhance um, germination and seedling health, because here we are sitting on the on the edge of seed starting season for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, but even people in the Southern Hemisphere, they're, they're probably going into their um, late summer sowings for their cool annuals and everything that are coming up in the fall. So it's, it's, it's prime seed starting time. And I want to do two things. I want to talk about just sort of the basics, the nuts and bolts of seed starting for people who are relatively new to it and could use some pointers. And then I also want to talk about regenerative farming practices, regenerative growing practices for seed starting, which usually involves a lot of natural inputs and, and working with microbes and everything like that. So we're going to start with the basics first so that we don't overwhelm anybody because I'm afraid if I go into all my like woo-woo things, people are going to be like, whoa, Jenny, don't know what you're talking about. A little scary backing up here. So let's start with basics, Lisa, which I think you can really help me um, tease that out for everybody. So Let's start with everybody just got some massive seed order from, say, the Gardener's Workshop or Geo Seeds or Johnny's. How should they store those seeds in your experience? What's the best way to store them so you can keep them fresh and germinating really well? Sure. And so I think you have to really step back and say, how long am I going to store these? Am mm -hmm. I going to be starting them in two or three weeks or am I going to be sitting on them for a longer period of time? Right. And um, the cue is to keep them cool and dry. And I think that's something that I didn't really have a grasp on is like how much humidity is present in your house or um, that type of environment. Because I always thought, well, I'll just, you know, leave them in my kitchen cabinet, right? <laughs> and that's probably okay for short-term storage. But um, if you, like so many people, are buy more seed than you actually are going to sow at one time, particularly if you're succession sowing, right? Um, then you want to just think how to keep them dry and cool. And um, we really kind of focus on that as seed sellers. You know, we're always trying to um, ensure that all of those practices are in place. Nice. Yeah, here for me, that involves, I get, because you've got like massive warehouse full of seeds. I, I have a nice little box of seeds. And for me, I store them in my cooler. Um, so they stay nice and cool and they stay dark. And so they're not exposed to daylight. And then um, the other thing I do is, you know, when you buy a pair of shoes and there's that little um, desiccant packet in the bottom of yep. that, or you could buy like kelp to eat and stuff that also there's a lot of products that have those little packets so i just yeah. save all of those <laughs> and there's like 25 of those packets in my seed box but it, it really helps with retaining or um not retaining but uh soaking up moisture so the seeds don't get it yeah and we actually sell those desiccant packets oh, you do? for people that need them yeah the bigger ones okay we actually sell the same ones that we use and yeah. um, because that really that was like the start of my learning how to store seeds it's yeah. like wow 
you know, maybe we need to be concerned about moisture. This was way back when, and that was the recommendation to us um, was to use those desiccant packs. So yeah, yeah, for sure. And that is, I mean, it's pretty interesting sometimes how those packets get full feeling, they get tight. Mm -hmm. Well, that's moisture. So yeah, yeah. Desiccants definitely recommended. Yeah, that's why, especially if you're if you are storing your seeds in like a cooler or a refrigerator, there use there's usually a fair amount of moisture in a cooler or refrigerator. So you don't want to just like put your seeds in there and be like, oh, they're fine because they're cool. No, you also right. have that second part. You need to keep them dry. Yes. That's what the dust yep. can is. Yeah. Okay. For good, sure. Good to know you sold those. I didn't even know that. So. Um, I mean, yeah. it's one of those inexpensive little things yeah. that you ought to have them. You right. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you, that's just one of those things you'll use it if you have it. So, yeah. yeah. If you don't, if, for those listening, if you don't um, have the desiccant packet and you and you do let moisture get into your seed storage area in some way, whatever whatever container you're using, you'll notice you'll have moldy seeds. And once you have moldy seeds that are kind of sticking together and got a little fuzzy stuff all over them, they're just they're just not going to germinate. You might as well throw the yeah. packet out. I mean, maybe you'll get two or three to germinate, but it's really, as a professional grower, you can no longer rely on that seed packet. So you might as well. A lot of energy to waste. Yeah, it really is. And money. My goodness. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So how long as a professional seed uh, supplier, how long do you think is generally an okay time frame to think that you could store most seeds successfully and still have germination? Now, bearing in mind, as I'm sure you're going to say, it depends on which crops, but what, yeah. what would you say are some time frames? Well, it 100% depends on how you're storing them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so generally, I mean, for us, we move seeds through so quickly. We have really quick turns mm-hmm. for that purpose. But as a grower, I mean, put aside my gardener's workshop and me, the flower farmer, if I'm storing them properly, at least two to three seasons, yeah. if they're being stored properly. And the easy way to figure out, are they good seeds? is to do a germination test. Right. You know, wet paper towel and a warm inside a little plastic bag on warm um, a heat mat or in a very warm situation um, and germ test them. You know, mm-hmm. do 20 seeds and solve the mystery <laughs> before you actually try to sow the seeds. And, you know, I mean, for me, frankly, back in the beginning, if a seed would have had 50% germination, I probably would not have thrown it away. Mm-hmm. I would throw it away today. Yeah. I mean, Seeds are the, I mean, unless you're talking a high dollar seed, um, it's just your time is so valuable to waste that much space. And, you know, I am not all about double sewing, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. that just gets crazy. Yeah. And double sewing, it, it does serve its purpose sometimes, but it just means yes. that you have all this additional work then later on where you either have to yes. tease them apart or pinch them out, or you may still have empty cells and all that stuff. I agree with you. At this point, if I think a packet doesn't have a solid 70% germination, I'd probably still yeah. throw it out because it's yeah. just too much work. Um, and I, I'll just echo that. Yeah, here I generally will store most of my seeds for three seasons before I start thinking like, oh, I should probably get a new batch of that in, except for anything in the carrot family I get new seed every year because carrots just don't store and that's things like docus and ami and um or all that stuff doesn't really like to hang out for very long yeah huh. I guess you know it's so funny there's just certain seeds because I do have a, an inside hook yeah for seed supply now <laughs> right um i never have to sit on seeds because we start i start all three of those and um i did not realize that they have a short shelf life i mean i'm very keenly aware of straw flowers and larkspur oh yeah straw those flowers definitely... another good one yeah. yeah yeah that's one i struggled for so long i'm so glad you brought up straw flower because people have asked me and i forget I forget sometimes these hard lessons I've learned. I spent like three years earlier on in my growing career trying yep. to grow straw flowers. And I was like, what the heck? These things have such terrible germination rates. What's wrong? I don't know. I just, and I literally gave up on straw flowers for like, yep, I did like too. five seasons. Like I, I just was like, this isn't worth it. And this was before you could buy straw flowers as plugs as readily as you can now, at least the interesting colors. And yeah, and then I don't know, some other grower told me like oh no you need fresh seed and I was like 
oh, fresh seed, huh? And then, yeah, the, the I ordered a very fresh seed from Johnny's. I even, like, called them and said specifically, like, when, can you tell me when this is packed? Is this, like, this year's right. harvest or whatever? And they assured me it was, like, new fresh seed. This was before the Gardener's Workshop was selling seeds, I think. And uh, otherwise, I would have called you. <laughs> but I, and I was like, okay, I'll give it one more shot. And lo and behold, like, 100% germination then. Like, yep. it's just about yep. the freshness. Yeah. We're doing some straw flower testing right now, yeah. some seed, and it's so interesting that some 100% just yeah. about, and some, uh-uh, no. and you, you knew you got old seed. Yeah, you know? yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's so quick. How I'm always quick to blame that it's operator error on myself, you know, to say it was me, but it can, in fact, with some seeds be, le le is it viable seed, actually? Right, Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned Larkspur because I also have a terrible time with Larkspur, but mostly because it's not because it's old seed, but just because I have bad soil for direct sowing and Larkspur needs a lot of times to be direct sown. Some people claim they can put plugs in, but yeah. I've never been successful. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, that. but maybe I've started um, saving my own seed of Larkspur so that I don't have to spend money on something that generally just doesn't germinate very well for me. And <laughs> we'll see. It's getting better, yeah. you know, year after year. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we've talked about freshness being really, really important. Um, and talking about storing them cold and dry is also important. Now let's talk about the actual sewing process and what it is to some of the basics. So um, proper timing is huge, don't you think? Like knowing when to sew it. Yeah. And I say, I, I would say that there's a, a step before this. Ooh, oh, is tell. People need to, I mean, I know that I mean, we typically are only starting annuals. I mean, that's the, the lion's share of our crops, right? So the next step is, is it a cool season hardy annual or is it a warm season mm. tender annual? Because that leads you to when you have to start this. Because no, I totally agree. I believe that timing is everything from, oh my goodness, when you start the seed to when you plant it to when you yeah. harvest it and the whole nine yards, right? So I think that that's an under... Um, so under mentioned step very often is that, I mean, I get the questions all the time. It's like people that want to sow bells of Ireland that live in the South in April. It's like, it's like, well, ours are like 30 inches tall. Yeah. You need to like pin that packet to your calendar in the fall. If you, if it fall sows for you or much, much earlier in the spring. And so yeah, timing is everything. So um, I don't even think I've told you this, that I'm in the middle of a book project. <gasps> oh, wait, uh, which is okay I can't for on many, air? I, I can't divulge <laughs> much information, okay. but I will tell you that that is something that I talk about. It's oh. like, you just really have to, before you even get all lathered up about yeah. seeds, you've got to like divide your seeds. Right. Cool and warm. Yeah. yeah. And that is, I, that's something that so many newer growers, and we've got lots of newer listeners or new grower listeners um, on the podcast here. Like, you just think, like, I'm starting seeds, period. Yep. Like, that's it. It's like one big broad statement i'm starting seeds and 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 so many newer growers don't realize that there's a ton of nuance to starting seeds which does like you said it begins with understanding when the seed wants to be sown and especially yeah. here in february when we're when you guys are listening to this the so many people are going to want to start like all the seeds right away cuz they're super excited and that is that is an understandable passionate response <laughs> to growing seeds in winter <laughs> but yeah, you're gonna I, lose them <laughs> we used to do that right yeah. I can remember just I mean I tell people that probably the biggest gift in gardening and far which led me to be a farmer was mm -hmm. Lynn Bazinski was the one that opened the door to me to cool season hardy annuals which of course became the book cool yeah. flowers mm -hmm. and why everybody else is standing there clutching their zinnias like they're their pearls, you know, there's <laughs> seeds. Those of us that understand that there are seeds that can be sown mm -hmm. when it's cool to cold and be yeah. started and planted out, you know, figuring this out just brings so much more fun. Yeah. 
in success yeah. to start seeds, right? You know? Yeah, so, you yeah, feel like you're yeah. you're 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 winning instead of, of losing. You know, when you yeah. when you plant those zinnias in early February, but your last frost date yeah. isn't until May, that was literally a total waste. You will maybe limp across that last frost date line <laughs> with these seedlings, but they're gonna be so sad and they'll never yeah, yeah. make a good crop. So it's better yeah. to understand. So this time of the year, so we can give everybody like a little nugget to chew on. Um, in early February, you would be sowing, I would be sowing straw flowers, um, snapdragons. These are um, some of the ones I do. Uh, Orlea could go uh, if you want to do it as seedling or as a transplants. What am I missing, Lisa? Give me some others that you would do oh, earlier. Well, so we, we just finished starting our big push of seed starting for cool season hardy annuals. Hmm. Um, and that's, we plants. And so of course, everybody needs to know that I grow everything out in the field. I don't have any hoop houses, yep. right? Um, so we plant tons of stock, hmm. straw flower. We start a lot of the um, sweet Williams that don't need fertilization, like Amazon is my go-to. We start that, even though we planted that also in the fall, it winters over for us. Um, and I'm also sitting here thinking also the, um, annual baby's breath do you grow oh, that oh i don't but i heard oh, you talk Jenny. about it last year that oh my you loved gosh. it you will it's white i mean it's yeah. like it, it i don't even want to call it baby's breath because yeah, yeah. everybody thinks they know what that looks like it is the sweetest and it is super cold hardy okay i would almost be willing to what are you are you six or seven uh, uh, uh technically seven i'm uh, maybe a little bit six b but yeah seven okay. i feel pretty safe in now yeah so um so we have some of that i'm just thinking what's growing in yeah. there in my room we just have so much stock and straw flowers yeah. growing because we yeah. start them by the colors you know right um but techn and calendula oh yep mm -hmm. balls craspedia um so really all of the cool season hardy annuals can be planted by pretty much everybody six to eight weeks before your last frost date, which that for me is mid-February. And we typically just plant transplants because you can't get a seed to sow outside in mm -hmm. freezing weather. Because I mean, we're still frozen and cold, but our beds were prepared last year right. to receive these plants that we're starting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're busy with, which keeps us from starting our warm season stuff <laughs> too soon. Right. And it saves you. It makes you a better gardener and farmer because you're too busy doing what you're supposed to do at the right time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so everybody just slow your roll. Don't do your, your warm annuals too soon yes. is ultimately the message that's coming across there. Okay. So the next thing is to talk about the actual sewing process. And you and I differ here a little bit um, in friendly ways, not, not any, uh, um, any sort of, Oh, uh, come on, let's bar. Oh, let's do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we've had, we've had this talk before. You do mostly soil blocks. I do mostly um, cell trays and I mm. have for the record done soil blocking, but but it's been a challenge for me because I grow in a greenhouse and they dry out so, so fast in a greenhouse. So I, I love the concept of soil blocks, but they really haven't worked out as somebody who's in a greenhouse setting. But for people who are growing indoors, literally in inside a building like you are, Lisa, soil blocks mm -hmm. seem to be awesome. And there's lots of ways to skin that cat in terms of like, what are you putting in your soil block or what are you putting in your cell trays? Um, but let's talk about your soil block mix. Exactly. What are the ingredients for that? You don't have to do the whole recipe, but what are the ingredients you're putting in a soil block? Sure. Um, so it's really pretty simple. It's kind of like a pound cake. Um, it's just peat moss or cocoa fiber, your choice. Although I do find cocoa fiber definitely dries out much more quickly than yeah. peat does. Um, so it's, peat moss or, com or cocoa and compost, along with the nutrients, um, green sand and rock phosphate. Um, and that's Elliot Coleman's recipe for the small blocker, um, which is what I just followed what he laid out. And it has um, truly paved the road to our seedling success because it's more than just having soil to plant your seeds in. It's yeah. creating that biological system from the ground up. And I didn't realize all that. I mean, looking back now, it's like, why was I so fortunate 
to learn how to prepare soil before. I mean, I didn't have a tractor for 12 years, you know I mean? So I was doing all the, we didn't call it no till. <laughs> I know that's a new buzzword. But that's kind of what <laughs> happened. And we used tons of compost mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So that's what our blocking mix is made out of. It is not non-sterile. We, I don't want anything sterile in my organic world pretty much. Yeah. Amen. And, sister. I, believe, and I believe that has a huge impact on your, I mean, all you have to read, you know, the book that the Bible that got me started, the gardening book is Elliot Coleman's new organic grower. And when he explains why it works, it's like, it makes perfect sense why our seedlings are so deep green, why they are short and stocky and they grow so fast and they hit the ground running. And, you know, I am a firm believer that a healthy transplant leads to more cash mm -hmm. in the end. Amen. Yeah, Talk preach to. it. <laughs> Preach it's it. true. Yeah, it's true. So um, there's been lots of studies. And then also, if you're just a grower and you've observed, you'll realize this, that the first, like, I think it was, I think it was maybe the first two days. Now I got to go back and find the study. I'll, I'll try to find it and put a link in the show notes. But I think it's the first two days of a seedling's life literally sets the trajectory for that plant for the rest of its life. As in, like, if it doesn't get exactly what it needs and the way it thrives, you know, the right temperature, the right amount of moisture, the right nutrients, the right microbes, um, all of that stuff. The first two days are so, so important to how productive that crop will be ultimately. Like, will you actually make money off of that? So it's so important to really spend time and energy on understanding seedling health and what you can do to enhance yeah. seedling health. So it's not just about getting that seed to germinate, which I think is where we all start, where it's just like, oh, yay, baby plant, it's here. And you like, you feel like, wow, I did it. But there's actually a lot more to that than um, than just getting it to crack the seed coat and, and send up a few little baby leaves. And that's, I think that's really what I wanted to kind of dive deeper into with you, Lisa, was to talk about this idea of how we can set our seedlings up for ultimate long-term health. Um, I liken it a little bit to like mother's milk. When a when a, a mammal baby is first born, you know, it, it gets its mother's milk right away. And in that mother's milk, there's all sorts of, you know, microbes, there's uh, hormones, there's nutrients that are only available for a short amount of time. And it's that mother's milk that really enhances um, and boosts the baby's immune system. And then it's it's also that mother's milk that feeds just the right nutrients to it to uh, be able for that young, young creature to grow. And it's exactly the same with seedlings. So now we have to figure out what is exactly mother's milk <laughs> for seedlings. Well, and, you know, I think it's, and y'all, we did, Jenny and I did not talk, plan this out. I mean, it's so <laughs> no, funny. This is totally impromptu. While we do things pretty differently, as every <laughs> farmer does, um, the bottom line is the same. First off, when you were just saying that about how those first couple of days after the birthing of a seed, where mm -hmm. it goes, I mean, I just talk about birthing seeds. It's like being in the presence of that happening is yeah. just like the most, that's why people start way more seeds than they need. That's why <laughs> people, and I'm going to pick on men because my husband used to be one of them. He only needed five tomato plants, <laughs> but he started 300 right. seeds. <laughs> and it's because that it's that miracle, right? Yeah, of, that energy of it. Of that. But what I wanted to say is when you were saying that about how, how that seedling is being, how the environment that it's in, um, where you can probably maybe overcome the struggle if that during that two weeks, if you work really hard at it later in life to try to make it up, you want to know what else is like that? Our dogs. I have to say <laughs> that. Because I used to be a puppy tester, temperament testing oh, puppies. Oh, wow. Back I didn't in know my that dog, was a I mean, thing. Back when I worked at a vet and had, was in the sport of dogs. Puppies, that first seven weeks, that's why it's so important where you buy your dog. Yes. I mean, you want to buy from serious dog people, hobby people that socialize yeah. and do all the proper things when they're little, because the seventh week is the fear week, bad thing. Dogs that get bumped with a vacuum cleaner during the seventh week are going to be afraid of vacuum cleaners for the rest of their oh, life. Oh, wow. I had no idea. <laughs> well, but it, but the bottom line is, yes, yeah. you can spend the rest of their life overcoming it. And we do that because few dogs actually get socialized in all things. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're all fearful of something. Um, but I think that's just true in plants, anything yeah. living. Yeah. 
there's that you reach that point and you can go this way or you can go you can go to the right or you can go to the left yeah and, exactly um, with plants i mean i'm just such a believer in getting them in the garden at the proper time not early hopefully not late but definitely not too early mm -hmm. and having a healthy transplant means that the rest of the growing experience is so simple. I mean, yeah. And it, it's it absolutely just, true because it, so, uh, so much of the time, you know, like, so, okay, here we are in February where everybody feels like it's going to be the best season ever. Yep. <laughs> and what it's, a myth. It, yeah, it is myth for the record. But what we do right now can translate to come August, we have plants out in the field that if we really pay attention, like you said, like with the same with dogs, if you, if you socialize them, do all the right things in the first seven weeks, that'll be an easy dog for the rest of its life. The same way, if you raise a healthy transplant right now and really yeah. focus your energy and possibly your money on this moment in this, in this um, young seedling's life, when it comes August, you won't have as much weed pressure. You want to know why? Because that plant grew up and put a big canopy yeah. on and shaded out the, out, out, yeah. out the competition. You'll also won't have as much disease pressure because that plant will be healthy and have all the microbes associated with it that it needs to and have a good root system, et cetera, et cetera. You won't have the pest pressure because it's going to be photosynthesizing at its maximum potential um, and the pe the pests aren't going to come in. There was a whole episode on this on the podcast here about bricks. You can go back and listen to that. Um, and and so there's all these things. It's like a compounding like positivity or a compounding negativity if you don't do it right. Yep. Yeah. So not to put too much pressure on everybody in this moment, because I know there's a lot of people that already have a ton of anxiety about seed starting. This is something you learn slowly, you guys. You'll listen to this and you'll hear other strategies and you'll you'll get it. Your only way you're going to learn is by doing it and screwing yeah. up. I mean, how many... I think I was on a live one day where, and somebody asked me, they were so uptight about their, it was the cold, it was probably right before the polar blast. Oh yeah. Of December of 2022. Yeah. And so many people that had fall planted cool flowers were so deeply concerned as I was, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it was the wind. Yeah. The we wind. had two and a half days of blowing 40 mile an hour winds. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody was just really freaking out. And I said, y'all, do you have any idea how many tens of thousands of plants that I have killed? <laughs> I mean, it's like, and that was like, they're like, you're kidding. I'm like, no. Yes, there's so many dead bodies back behind me. <laughs> I mean, it's a oh trap. my goodness. Yeah. But that's what it takes to learn. Yes, it I does. Mean, you have to make a failure or a mistake at mm -hmm. least once a day, at oh, least yeah. once a day. Or you're not doing something right. Yeah. You'll never do anything right. And yeah. so, yeah, I don't want people to feel pressured. Um, but I never, I mean, of course, back when I first started farming, I, I actually had bought some bricks. Um, I had bought some products for a lot of the things that you talk about. Peaceful Valley sold a yeah. lot of brews that yes. you mix. And I mean, they sat in my cellar for so many years because there really wasn't any support of mm. information yeah. 25 years ago, right? you know, about doing it. And I got frustrated anyway. So we've all been, you know, don't, don't let people do not get stressed. Yeah. Yes. Just keep starting seeds and figuring it out. Yes. And I've always said, and I know you, you've said it too, Lisa, seeds are cheap. At the end of the yep. day, seeds are the cheapest thing you're going to input into your farm. Everything else is a lot more expensive, but seeds are cheap. There's right. obviously a couple fancy extra expensive ones out there, but even right. the really expensive ones, frankly, are not that expensive. Um, when you come right. down to the like per seed price, we're talking like a half a cent to like two cents each. So it's not so bad. Um, and, and so you might as well, you know, test your, test your metal on those on seeds instead of buying in a bunch of expensive plants and then failing sure. with expensive plants, which is a lot worse. So it fail with seeds, I guess. And I think, um, given your seedlings, you know, I have five, I have tweaked, you know, I grow in a grow room. I don't have greenhouses. We've mentioned earlier, and I just have an easy control on the temp air temperature in there and have lights. And I mean, when you just figure out your space mm -hmm. 
Um, it just does make it so much easier. I feel the frustration of people that are trying to start inside of a home um, where they like, you know, you've got to have at least like a pantry. You have to have a, an enclosed area that you can kind of control it a little bit more than the corner of your kitchen. Yeah. Your family's going to, you know, cry uncle if you try to, you know, mess with the temperature too much. But I think it's worth figuring that out because that's been my key to success. I feel like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, but when we were starting 100,000 seedlings a year throughout the whole year, throughout the, all the seasons, I mean, we killed a lot of stuff doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? We figured yeah. it out. And, yeah. and I do think that us being flower farmers, Jenny, because we're starting volume, that gives us an advantage. The person at home that's just starting a few yeah. or a new grower that's not quite starting as many, um, it's not quite as obvious when you obviously made a mistake. Right. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, so I understand that struggle, but don't be discouraged. Just yeah. keep on. Keep Just trying. Keep, on. keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. And you brought up a good point um, in terms of the actual like the germination stage of things. Having a super controlled environment is hugely, hugely helpful. Um, so you can control the humidity, you control the temperature just right. And so for me, what I've done here is similar to you, actually, is I do start all my seeds inside of a quote unquote germination chamber, which is just a germination room, which is my cooler. Normally during the flower growing year, I, you know, that's my cooler. It's a highly insulated space. And so it's very easy to flip a cooler to become your germination space in January, February in March before you'd have right. flowers and need them because then you can just really dial it in um, and just put some lights in there. And that's been hugely helpful to me since I've I've moved to that system. But there's also plenty of uh, YouTube videos and and I don't know, plans online for building, a, a, taking an old stand-up well, our old freezer, I don't know whether it has to be a stand-up freezer initially or not, but taking an old freezer, um, like a deep freezer, and turning it into a germination chamber. Which mm -hmm. So if you're somebody who really doesn't have space and you're new to this, but you're kind of handy, all you need is find a place that's got a junk freezer. You could probably get it for free. And then you need like a crock pot and you need some like shelving in there and then you're okay. good to go and you can germinate thousands and thousands of seedlings uh, in that environment. So look that up, you guys, if you haven't ever heard of a germination chamber like that. Um, yeah, it's there's it's amazing the things you can do when you're kind of desperate. Yeah. When they, an ingenuity, baby, ingenuity. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Somebody recently told me, Oh, I'm going to botch this saying, but I, it was something about like constraint. It's not, it's a, uh, not necessarily necessity. It is the mother and all invention, but constraint when you're limited is when you think bigger, actually, that's when it like forces you to think bigger is when you have limitations. And I kind of love that. I kind of think that's really true. You know, that when at the highest dollar per square foot I ever reaped mm. on my farm was back when I only had two quarter acre gardens yeah then it, you start expanding and getting more spaces you lose that concentration of effort yeah. and just milking something for all of its worth and getting everything out of it so I totally my train of thought with all where I was headed with this trajectory so we've got oh the germination like controlling the conditions and this is going to be different everybody for different crops depending on whether it's a cold cool season crop or a hot annual season crop um but generally generally uh like 68 70 ish right lisa do you feel like um that temperature is kind of a decent temperature if you had to pick up air temperature yeah yeah sorry air temperature yeah. like a, if people right. have no, to always, do all of it yeah. in one room basically yeah <laughs> so for cool for us when especially if they're using a seedling heat mat mm. i find that the air temperature between 65 and 68 cool season hardy annuals likes warm soil cool air. Mm -hmm. That's what seems to have the best germination. And then once we start warm season stuff, we drive that temperature up in the room because um, they they need more warmth. Some warmth. Yeah. Yeah. But now how do you manage 
to grow the shorter stockier seedlings if it's a warm room like do you drop the temperature then because a lot of times for those that don't know there's something called diff d-i-f which is the difference in temperature between if you are growing outside daytime and nighttime temperature when you're indoors in a super controlled environment you often want to um kind of uh, control diff because that's what creates whether plants get super long and leggy or they stay nice and squat. And for the record, you generally want more squat seedlings yeah. because they're healthier. A lot of times people say like, look, my calendula seedlings are like four inches tall, to which I say, oh boy, just start over. <laughs> you know, if they're like the like, long, wimpy, wispy things. So how are you keeping yours short and stocky? I mean, in the greenhouse, I feel like it's a little easier for me, but in a room, how do you do that? So I really just, we keep it cool when we're growing cool season, hardy annuals, the air temperature. Um, and what part of my room is like a 10 by 10 room mm -hmm. and it's got lots of windows, which we don't rely on those windows for light. Um, it just happened to be built that way. I didn't, you know, I was very inexperienced when we built this building. I thought that that was going to contribute, but in fact, it didn't. So when we're growing cool season hardy annuals, um, we leave the door open to that room, to okay. this big room that I'm sitting in now. And so that kind of keeps the temperatures from actually climbing in there. Um, and, you know, frankly, we just, we have grow lights that are right on top of the transplants. We, there are surely, I'm just trying to think who, I mean, sweet peas are one of those crops mm. that we, we germinate them outside now. In the, mm. in the cool, as Farmer Bailey talks about, um, because they do elongate. You can't keep them short. No, you can't. It's the temperature. <laughs> it's the temperature that's yeah. driving them. But in general, 90% of the seedlings that we grow, we just keep them cool for cool season. And when I say cool, we're just not letting it climb up in the afternoons yeah. when it's bright sun in there. Um, and I'm sure that there are crops that that would make a huge difference. The diff would. Yeah. But in general, we just don't find that to be a real problem. And again, that's just another, I mean, Jenny, you may or may not know this, but I'm a pretty simple person. <laughs> I just try to find what works yeah. for the mass. Yep. And there are some things that it just doesn't work well for. And I either say, well, get on down the road. We don't need you in our lineup. <laughs> or I try to figure it out like we did with sweet peas. Yeah. Um, but it's just trying to keep the temps from climbing yeah. when it's cool and stuff um, and the hot stuff just will take it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll echo that. Just keep it cool. Like slow, you know, cool and slow is the way to go instead of fast yeah. and hot. Um, seedlings yeah. that are grown too hot, they just never... You really, you just can't shrink them, you know? Like if they get this Ugh. long, weak, stretchy stem, you know, it's, it, that that there is a seedling that will never really be productive. It will Trash always them. struggle. Add them to the compost yep. bin. Yep. I mean, I am so quick to throw out, you know what, who else? I was trying to think who else has that problem, <laughs> you know, because we start tons of sunflowers. Yeah. We start sunflowers every single week and depending on what the weather's doing outside as far as early in the season, we will we all start them all indoors in plug trays on heat then i would pop them on mm -hmm. the floor under my lowest shelf that doesn't have anything on it yet mm -hmm. with a grow light above it those sunflowers will get so <laughs> lanky so oh my lanky. god it's i mean and it's like you can't you don't have enough money to pay people to plant them nope. because they are a nightmare and they don't ever perform yeah that's what i think people need to understand yeah we've tracked it Healthy transplants produce more abundance, taller stems, better quality. Puny transplants struggle, make you crazy. You pull your hair out. Yep. And then in the end, you don't even have that much to show. You'll have some flowers, but you'll think, why, why are these blooms so much smaller? Yeah. Why are they just not, or they fell worse yet, fallen victims to pests? Yeah. Well, guess what? It was your seed starting right. process that caused that to happen. To and to I just wish somebody would have told me that yeah. 25. So wait, 20 what's, what's, what's your, your secret for sunflowers starting indoors now? Because I, so I try to do this like really early, uh, um, 
sowing of sunflowers indoors because what I do is I interplant them with my mm -hmm. overwintered dahlias. So I have these dahlias that stay in the ground. Right. And when we uncover that dahlia patch in early April, there's all this open space that's not going to have anything really in it, you know, for right. another month. So I can get this like early succession of pro cut horizon because that's a 60 day sunflower. Um, but I have to start them indoors first. And sometimes they do fine. And then other times they're stupid leggy rats and I'm so annoyed with them. And I never really understood what the difference is. Do you have yeah, a specific so, trick? I mean, we all, our plan is always to get them in the ground when they're two and a half weeks old. Okay. I mean, you go days, that's, that's for our environment. We say two to three weeks, but for us, Bobo has perfected at two weeks. They're about I would guess four mm -hmm. and a half inches or so, and she can pull the stem and it pops right out of the cell pack. Um, and it, the timing is really, really important. And if we, and obviously that early in the year, you wouldn't be setting them outside um, until it's time to plant yeah. or you put them in a house, I guess. Um, so I would start them inside on heat. And the minute you start seeing necks coming up, get, get them out. under grow, and grow okay. edge right on top of them. But have, don't start them until you're about two weeks out from when you're going to uncover those dahlias um, because Bobo has said she's the planner here mm. it is easy even if she has to dig a few of them out of the cell pack with a little wooden um, plant like a popsicle stick or a butter knife you know, butter knife so work annoying. great <laughs> yeah and you know I mean it's so annoying but she said it's easier for me to have them a little earlier to have to do that than to have those tangled up. I mean, those twisted necks, mm -hmm. they go in mm -hmm. post heat now. Yeah. But yeah, it's a lack of light. Yeah. And sitting in trays too long. And they're impossible. Yeah. I think I think what it is is I probably started them. Well, it's like you know it's tricky that time of the year because I'm. Yeah. It's like when will it? Because sunflowers are a little frost tolerant. If if you do it just right, you know you got to put the frost cloth over them, harden them off right. I know Jonathan Lease um, and Megan have have mastered that um, at Springforth Farm. So I've, I've tried to replicate that, but you know, it's still, it's early April. Who the heck knows what's going to yeah. happen with the weather? And it was probably the sure. years and I wasn't really thinking about, it. yeah, it's even just that one extra week spent in a cell tray is, you know, that's when they're not going to do it right. So Yeah. And you know, as you, sunflowers are so much more hardy, we get sunflowers um, two weeks before Mother's Day. Wow. Planting them outside. I mean, they are cold hardier than we think they mm -hmm. are. And we start, we have a big, I do them. Um, um, and have a lot of people that follow along with us and do it. Um, it's just amazing under that row cover how early you can get those boogers out there. Yeah. As transplants, right. obviously. As transplants. Yeah, because the soil's too cool for the record. Don't yeah. go direct seeding your sunflowers yeah. in April. <laughs> that is not sure. going to work. That's sure. just bird food. That's what that is. <laughs> So, all right. So we talked about timing um, in terms of, uh, you know, not starting too early and the temperatures and stuff. But one other thing I want to mention about timing, which I cannot really articulate very well because I'm not that good at this yet, but um, is biodynamics, like sowing by the biodynamic calendar, which is what I started doing. We started doing at my farm, I think, two years ago now. I, for the record, I am no... Uh, wealth of knowledge about biodynamics. I had a wonderful episode back in season two with Erica and Ken from Teton Full Circle Farm. That's a biodynamic flower farm. You should listen to that if you haven't already. But I, the one piece of biodynamics that I've been able to implement successfully, because it's a very complex system, I guess is the right word, system, practice, I don't know religion, possibly. Uh, but it's a very <laughs> dynamic thing and it's complex. And I frankly have yet to wrap my whole brain around all of it. But the the sewing by the biodynamic calendar has actually worked really well for me. Like I was very skeptical of this in the beginning. And we we tracked the sort of the success rate of sewing just generically, like I'd always done with my sewing schedule that I'd had for like a decade plus versus now transferring that sewing schedule to the biodynamic calendar. And I've got to tell you, Lisa, and you know me, I, I'm not really into like a lot of like foo-foo stuff. I'm kind of a real like gritty nuts and bolts person, but the seedlings germinate so much faster 
when you follow the biodynamic calendar and they are like uniform germination instead of like sometimes, you know, it'll be certain seeds that are kind of a little spotty up and down. Um, there's something about that biodynamic calendar that really makes sense because it has to do with the the pool and the energy in the world of like water rising and falling down in the soil profile. And then also um, just the celestial energy. Um, and there's lots of science to actually back this up now. This is not totally woo woo. Um, so I'm just going to say for listeners, you may want to try the biodynamic calendar and if you have no idea where to start with that, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to an, an, a website where you can find out the right date for what you're sewing based on the biodynamic calendar. It makes it really easy. I see you have questions, so, Lisa. <laughs> so when, when you say sewing, mm -hmm. you're talking about starting indoors, yep. right? Because mm -hmm. we typically say that and think outdoors. Yep. So I just want to clarify. Yep. So you're yep. talking about starting indoors. And so that link that you're going to put, does that include flowers? I mean, yes. do they have specific flower? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm it is, open. is the, the, the basic formula is that there are, so the, the, the and again, you guys, Anybody who's actually like a biodynamic master, please forgive me right now because I really, I don't know that much about this. But basically, the biodynamic calendar is is um, broken down into lots of different components that go into it. But we're just going to talk about moon phases right now. So there's the the sort of the waxing moon, the waning moon, there's new moon, and there's a full moon. And because of the moon cycle, there's certain days you should be sowing seeds there's certain days you should be transplanting seedlings. There's certain days you should do nothing. It literally says it's the barren phase. And so within this, the days of the month that you should, or the days of the moon cycle, which I believe is waxing. <laughs> Actually, now I'm going to forget, but <laughs> I'm telling you, I just follow this website, you guys. <laughs> I am no practitioner. Uh, but anyway, within those sowing days, those days that are designated for seed sowing, there are days specifically uh, annotated as flower seed sowing days, root mm. seed sowing days, leaf seed sowing days, and fruit seed sowing days. So there's four categories of plants, you know, so it's like you'd sow lettuce on a different day than you would sow um uh, broccoli, because broccoli is considered a flower. Um, uh, and with, with us, you know, there's you would sow eucalyptus on a different day than you would sow zinnias. So um, it's interesting and worth looking into. One of the things I like about the biodynamic calendar is that it's just helped me kind of block off specific days to do seed sowing. At first, I thought it was going to be really hard to get all my seeds sown in this like one day. <laughs> uh, but really, it's it's helped. What's ultimately done is it then staggers the planting and the transplanting. It, it really works itself out. It's like kind of a, a nice little timetable. Um, but again, I'm not I'm not well versed enough to talk about this all together other than to say I use the biodynamic calendar. I do think it works. I will put a link in the show notes to the um, to the the site that I use to help me decide which days are the right days. And my upcoming biodynamic seed sowing for flowers day in Philadelphia, because it does differ by your, where you are in the world a lot in terms of like your parallels sure. and all that stuff. But mine is February 21st is my next big. I want to talk about um, natural inputs as well, uh, just to bounce across some of the things we've already talked about, Lisa, in terms of like what you can put in that soil mix, what you can spray on young seedlings to help with the germination, right. that mother's milk concept that we were talking about. So when I say natural inputs, that's a term we use in regenerative farming, which basically means... Usually it's something you make yourself, but sometimes you buy it, but it's a lot, a lot to do with like a homemade thing and it uses just natural inputs, natural ingredients to make this thing. Um, right. Or you could buy it in. So uh, one of the ones that I use uh, for seed starting is, well, I'm going to I'm gonna actually back up and refer to Korean natural farming and Jadam. These are two practices, again, systems that talk about this a lot. And um, if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of my other podcast episodes about Korean natural farming and Jadam. Um, and that's where a lot of these inputs come from. So there's something in 
KNF, Korean Natural Farming, called uh, WCA. That stands for Water Soluble Calcium. This is an input that you can make yourself at home using eggshells and vinegar. So eggshells, and I use an apple cider vinegar. You could use a brown rice vinegar, not a white vinegar. Don't use a white vinegar. You basically need sort of like this raw vinegar that has all the microbes in it still as well. Why? And you um, just put um, the eggshells and the vinegar for a week or two, and they extract the calcium out of the eggshells. And now you have a liquid um, calcium feed for, link in the show notes to a recipe for how to make this specifically. But essentially, seeds and seedlings, once they're born, need calcium uh, to create good, strong root systems. And this is just an easy way to put calcium into the mix. Lisa, do you use anything that's like a calcium additive to your mix in any way? Is that the green sand maybe? Or do you know if there's green anything? Green sand is a micronutrients and I'm just sitting here looking at, um, and it's full of a lot of good stuff, but it's yeah. got a broad range of micronutrients plus me has obviously got potassium in yeah, it. Yeah, right. Um, and so our we put rock phosphate, which is actually colloidal phosphate. Mm. Um, and it's just it's in a form that your plants can actually utilize yeah. it. Because one of the struggles that we hear people, you know, back when I started soil blocking, literally a quarter of a century ago, you could go to the big box stores and find green sand and rock phosphate right next to the bone meal on those shelves, you know, where they had the, the, uh, the individual mm -hmm. ingredients um, to do it. And that's no longer the case, right? I mean, as we have kind of, phase these out. But no, I have not specifically added any calcium um, to that stage. And again, I guess for me, using soil blocks, mm -hmm. the growing time is so short. You know, we shave about a third of the transplant growing time inside um, that I may try it. Yeah, you no, know, I never know. You, you never know what you're missing <laughs> until you try something. Right. Right. But I mean, up until we just, We've had healthy, great seedlings. Mm -hmm. Would I love them better? Of course I would. <laughs> you know, right. but right. for me, if the wheel doesn't squeak because of the broad, especially I know people that don't have help like you and I do, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to see these little bumps that you can do that can really add richness to your process, yeah. but you might not even be able to recognize much less do it. So right. yeah. And idea. everything I talk about here is just like, these are things that studies have shown increase seedling health, but it doesn't mean you have to do all of them. All we, obviously loads of seedlings are grown without all this extra right. fuss. Um, this is just that sort of like that idea of adding a little bit of mother's milk to to the process just to get them extra, extra revved up. So various studies have just shown that um, calcium enhances um, the germination and then also will lengthen the, the radical, that very first root that a seedling develops. Yeah. Um, when calcium is present specifically in studies, they've noted that the radical it lengthens much more quickly um, and just in general is longer. And therefore, with that longer, healthier radical, that means the seedlings able to absorb nutrients and water faster, you know, so it'll it'll or rev food. it up. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So that's what the calcium is about. Then there's also kelp or seaweed. That's another stimulant for germination, which I'm yeah. suspecting is in that green um, green sand somehow or another. I don't know. Something like this is probably present already right. for you. Um, you know that um, what was so interesting years and years ago when I was out traveling on the road speaking, I um, followed a guy in a room, you know, it was breakout sessions. He's not a farmer. His name was Paul Tukey. He was an organic lawn care professional. He hmm. used to have a show on Home Garden TV. And he starts his talk off by telling why he's not on Home Garden TV anymore. There was no advertising dollars oh. in his show. And, but he shared the secret of these amazing lawns that they would grow. And they sprayed, the, after they sow the, the seeds, mm -hmm. which are, then um, lightly covered with compost, um, but then they sprayed them with either seaweed fish, um, a, a lower dose mm -hmm. than what your bottle actually says, um, or a kelp-like liquid. 
And he said it enhances germination so much. So ever since he has said that, um, if the time allows itself, <laughs> not always, um, I will mist my blocks after I've sewed them, especially if it's a difficult to, mm -hmm. you know, one that I think might need a little bit of extra, but it's the seaweed that, um, seems to, I mean, we definitely see an increase. Yeah. It's the, so what, what it's, what's happening there is in kelp or seaweed, um, there are, um, plant growth hormones. So there's something called right. gibberellins and auxins are both in, uh, kelp and seaweed. I don't know whether kelp and seaweed are totally interchangeable for the record. I don't know whether that's the exact same plant or not, but anyway, uh, kelp, I use a product called maxi crop for what it's worth. It's a powder that you then mix into, um, into water and you can spray it, but basically Basically, the gibberellins that are in there, that's a plant growth hormone, totally natural for the record, right. um, exists, you know, just in the world. The gibberellins help crack the seed coat. So it kind of works as like a, as a, you know, an, an enzyme that chews up the seed coat, which is a good thing when you want the seed to germinate. So that helps do faster germination. Seeds it up. Yeah. Yep. And then the auxins um, contribute, once the seeds actually germinated, the auxins contribute to um, enhanced root development. So then again, it's like, basically, if you can get a seedling to have a really healthy root system faster, that is the gold. That is, that is what you're after. Because once a seedling has a good, healthy root system, then the seedling itself will be fine thereafter, no matter what abuse you subject it to. <laughs> so. I mean, it's really true. Yeah. I mean, as soon as a seed can get busy mm -hmm. and do its job, they don't get into trouble anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I kind of look <laughs> at it. And temperature plays a role in that too. I was just trying to look to see, um, do you have the nerd book the nerd it's not book. actually a book um it's on seed germination Ooh. by doctor it's online now i can send you the link and yeah, we can yeah. put it in the notes for yeah. anybody that wants it um this is dr dino's d-e-n-o you don't have this book i don't have this book so it's not even really a book it's like this thick it's like an inch and a half thick but i got the first book i saw it i forget where i mean i've had it since the beginning of time you sent like your 35 dollars in and they sent you one he did it for a university well now there's it's 1993 is the first 1996 and 1998 you can find them online anyway it's a nerd's deep dive about every different kind of seed and he was talking about because i was going to look in there and see he was talking about how it's the theory, yeah. seed germination theory and practice. Ooh. And this is not a sit down, you know, easy read, um, but it talks in there about how temperature also plays a role in this process that we're talking about. Right. Um, and there were some surprising things that he said when I was rereading it yesterday, okay. pulled it out. And um, so, but I also want to say to people, don't think it has to be this complicated. Right. We, how long I've been farming for 25 years. How long you've been farming, Jenny? 15 now. Yep. So we've had a long time <laughs> of not doing all this stuff of great success. Yes. So you, this is like, you want to just get better and more refined and grow better, healthier plants and be sustainable in your environment and make your, I mean, We've been saying since the beginning of time, I want to garden and have it get easier every year. Yep. And that's what using the inputs. I also feel like, and this is something that Elliot Coleman, I really kind of zeroed in on when I first started soil blocking, that killer soil blocking mix that I use with all the plants I'm transplanting out in my garden, figure up how much input into your garden mm -hmm. soil that ecosystem yep. is and that's it's just really really important and I think people just undervalue I mean I'm so glad that we talked about seed starting because I think people think it's just getting a plant big enough to put it out in the right. garden exactly yeah but and there's it can so much start that way. it can it can but there's also lots of listeners to the show who have had time and some experience to to get to the point where they're ready to up their game yeah and when you when you create awesome create this soil mixture, this living soil. For the record, ultimately, a, a seedling started in living soil that has lots of good, um, good inputs to it, 
but soil that's also rich in biology. Like you said, Lisa, you put that yeah. into your your soil out in your in your beds, and now suddenly you've just transferred and amplified all of that goodness yeah. out into your beds. And you do that season over season over season, and you really make a huge difference in what you have out there. So that's why I just wanted to go into into the detail of it a little bit but not to intimidate anybody either. And so a couple other inputs that I'll just rattle off in terms of like, these are a little like, these are, this is like extra credit, you know, it's extra credit in class. You can get an A without it, but if you want to get an A plus plus plus, you go, you go do this extra credit. So some of the extra credit is something that's um, an input that you can make yourself. It's part of Korean natural farming's um, inputs. It's called LAB. And LAB stands for lactic acid bacillus. It's a type of bacteria, a very good bacteria. It basically ferments on or grows on on milk. Um, That's what the lactic acid part of it is. And this is a very good bacteria that is excellent for combating diseases. It's very good for staving off pythium and fusarium. So this is sort of a natural alternative to buying things like root shield or actinovate and that kind of stuff. Um, So I like to include LAB in my seed sowing process so that I will have less disease pressure um, early on in the seedling's life. Uh, And then another super weirdo thing, which I use a little bit, but this is totally in left field, you guys. This is not something I'm actually like saying, go get this right now, is something called wood vinegar. Have you heard about this yet, Lisa? Uh -uh. Yeah. So there's this, so listeners of the podcast will hopefully remember there was an episode on making biochar. So there's this thing you can do is you can make biochar by burning wood debris, woody debris, and that creates biochar that you put into the soil and that helps with building um, essentially housing for microbiology and then also soil retention and so forth. But during the process of making biochar, there's this smoke that um, kind of, you know, is given off by the process. And people have found a way to sort of condense that smoke into a liquid form, which they're calling wood vinegar is the product name of the of it in general. I think they're trying to delineate it from liquid smoke because liquid smoke's like that oh, stuff yeah. you use in yeah. the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a weird name. Wood vinegar is a weird name, but it is essentially liquidized smoke. Um, And the reason I mention it is because there's some studies that show that it enhances germination because there are certain species of like, say, wildflowers or um, some perennials and so forth that only germinate naturally after a wildfire comes through Um, and the wild and the fire, the smoke triggers their germination. And so I just thought I would briefly mention wood vinegar because apparently it can help aid in germination of some of the like trickier perennial stuff that maybe sometimes we wanted to germinate and we're having a hard time with. So I don't personally... Interesting. Yeah, it's weird. I have a bottle of it that I've been sort of playing around with. I don't... I can't sit here and say like you need to use wood vinegar. I, I really don't have enough like faith in it, but it is something worth mentioning it for the total nerds in the in the audience. (laughs) to see what that's about. And I think the more you start seeds, the more things like this, you start, you Mm want to get better. You want to perfect process. And um, that's awesome. Yeah. So the last bit that I will say for, and you do this too in your mix, um, Lisa, I know, is we got to get microbes in there. We do not want a sterile environment. There's too often, for whatever reason, somewhere along the way, a lot of horticulturalists, a lot of gardeners got brainwashed into thinking you should have sterile, like a sterile space. You need sterile soil, sterile seeds. You have to like sterilize everything, get rid of all germs, quote unquote. But in reality, seeds have evolved with specific microbes like that are like their co-pilots. They need these microbes to understand that it's time to germinate. <laughs> like they can't if they don't have them. There's a really cool book. I don't know if you've read it yet, Lisa. It's by Jeff Lohenfeld. He's the guy that did the teeming with bacteria, teeming with microbes, yeah. teeming with fungi, the teeming, <laughs> the teeming books. Yeah. Uh, teeming guy. Yeah, the teeming guy. And he just came out with, I think it's called, I think This one is teeming with bacteria. But in that, he talks about how seeds have evolved so much with bacteria. Like there's all these studies that show how important that bacteria is to them. So we do not want to sterilize our seeds um, because you're going to take away what they need to germinate. And then you also want to put them into an environment with lots of life, you guys. (laughs) Lots of life. (laughs) 
<laughs> like so much life. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's just, if you just kind of stop and think about it, it's like, gosh, you want to put this teeny little living thing mm -hmm. on top of this iceberg. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I mean, it's like, there's nothing there to support it or to help it or yeah, it just made perfectly good sense to me. I mean, I just, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. And for you, you put um, compost in your soil block mix, and that's your source of microbiology um, yep. in general, right? Yeah. Yes. And how much? It how, is good quality yeah. compost. Yeah. I think that's the key. I wanted to say it's like you need to have a good, well-aged compost, um, not new raw compost or compost that's got lots of weird, big, chunky bits in it. Do you screen your compost right. when you put it in? We well for soil blocking, you pretty much, I mean, should you screen to. everything. Is yeah, you just it's just easier to do it. Um, and you know, I've often told people it's like, all right, it's February. You might not be able to get compost where you are right now. That's really great, but you should buy it right now to have it for a year from now, right. you won't have to worry. So if you get a year ahead, you know, I am a firm believer and we don't even use manures anymore. So with the herbicide yes. issue, um, but we used to get our manures and let them, and we would compost them for a year. We didn't depend on other people's word to do that. Um, but yeah, the compost, you just have to really screen it. Um, and then we store it so that it, you know, stays healthy and alive and, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Getting compost in a year in advance is the best way to do it, to let it sit yep. there and, and compost. The other thing that I always worry about with compost, and you, you hit on it, but I'm just going to say it for the record for everybody. Um, you need to do a, a, essentially a germination test in the compost before you go making 5,000 soil blocks and seeding those soil blocks because compost these days can come with herbicide in it, a residual mm -hmm. herbicide that will just kill everything. And so if you got in compost and it's not your own compost, now if you made your own compost, you probably don't have this worry, but if it's something you purchased in, you want to you want to just do a seed test on that, a germination test of sorts, which is basically just take about a cup of it. Um, and so I use radish seeds because they come up really fast. Um, just sow some radish seeds on it just to see, just to watch. Do they they look healthy when they germinate, then you're good to go. Thumbs up. If they're like yellowing or they're like they don't germinate or like if anything looks really out of place, um, then you do not want to use that compost in your seed starting mix because then you lose all of your seedlings and that would be horrible. You know, um, I've become good friends with Joe Lample. He has the, a TV show called Growing a Greener World. He tells the story yeah. that he used contaminated manure. Oh, it's the worst. He built 16 large raised beds for his TV show. Oh, my gosh. I mean, it was a beautiful garden. And they filled the beds up, and all of a sudden, everything started distorting. <sighs> I mean, the story, you can go to a growergreenandworld.com and look, search his blogs and just, oh, my gosh. Oh, it that would have been heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. And then he had to find a way to either get rid of it or to see, I don't remember what his resolve was. Yeah. I mean, I just say to him now, it's like, I don't even use straw anymore unless yeah. it's, you can't find organic straw. Yeah. Cause we you have can... friends that straw their gardens with mulch and then watch their whole garden die. Yep. I've even um, had, I, I don't know if it happened for sure. It's my suspicion that I got leaves in. Like I use a lot of leaves. I know you use a lot of leaves too. And one year I got leaves in and used them on a bed and I just, I, it was a bed of snapdragons and those snapdragons were just constantly puckered and twisted and, and I could huh. not for the life of me figure out what it was. And then eventually I just had to come to the conclusion. I think there was some sort of herb residue on the leaves that were slowly breaking huh. down. I don't, I don't generally know. have that problem for the record. Right. I still use truckloads, literal truckloads of leaves, right. but it is right. something to to think about, you know? Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. It's getting tougher too. Yeah, it is. So, but if you can get a good quality compost, that's great. Or if you don't want to worry about herbicides, the thing that I really rely on in my seed starting mix is worm casting. So mm -hmm. um, I have my own worm bin and you all will want to get your own worm bin too, eventually. Again, not something you have to start with right now today, but uh, worm castings, fresh worm castings are the elixir of life for uh, 
all plants, like every every stage of growth of plants, there's so much amazing science behind worm castings. Basically, the gut of a worm, of an earthworm, is this place where like nutrients are extracted to become a plant soluble form. So it means you get your plants are able to eat the nutrients a worm poops out. That we all kind of know. But then what's also amazing is there's special microbiology that lives only in the worm's gut. And that microbiology is kind of pooped out <laughs> with the worm, like when it, everything else comes out. And then that's the cool microbiology that really helps enhance plants and their, their vigor and their health. Also, worms, when they poop out, also excrete calcium because they have some sort of special gland in their body that like pushes um, calcium out. So that's another thing we talked about how important calcium is to seedlings. So the, the, there's several studies that have also shown that um, worm castings, uh, they, they help with se disease suppression. So they suppress fusarium and pythium. Those are two big issues when you're doing seedlings, dampening off. Um, and they also enhance germination. There's several studies that show they enhance germination. Again, because seed, seeds themselves need those special microbes that will kind of piggyback right. with them and do their thing. The trick here is that you need fresh, unsterilized worm castings. So you can buy worm castings, I think, from Home Depot or someplace. Um, I sometimes get them in from Fertrell, my, my fertilizer place. You can get those in big bags, but those have been sterilized. They have to be sterilized to be able to be sold, mass produced like that. Sterilized, like we've said before, is not good. Sterilized means all the good stuff is gone. So you don't want to use, you can't, it's not like the sterilized bag worm, ca worm castings are bad. They just don't have the good stuff. In they there. are missing. They're missing <laughs> yeah. the icing on the yeah. cake. Right. Cake's exactly. in there, the cake's but there. there's no icing. And who wants cake without icing? Let's be honest. For sure. <laughs> like, God, I want the ice cream too, for the record, yeah. not just the yeah. icing. But... Yeah. So it's really important to get fresh worm castings. Um, and this is why every, I I firmly believe every good gardener, every good farmer needs their own worm farm, their own worm bin. Um, I have one that's just called Can of Worms is the brand name from, I got it from Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. Super easy to set up um, and get cranking. And they produce tons of castings. It's a really fairly small, like, at, you know, in-home system. Um, or you can get really big and wild. I had a show with Matt Arthur from BLH Farms. Um, it's the Bokashi podcast show with where he and I talked about larger scale worm production, worm farming. <laughs> so listeners can go back and listen to that. Matt actually sells the fresh worm castings, like unsterilized, just send you a jar of worm castings. If you guys listening need fresh worm castings, um, that's where you can go until you get your, your worm bin set up. But I, I, for the record, just started using worm castings um, and what's called vermicast extract. So that's a process of, of diluting the worm castings into water. I just started using that two years ago. The overall health and disease, the health has gone up, the disease pressure has gone down of my entire farm since I started using this. Like it's, it's magic, magic fairy dust <laughs> that you can So how do you apply it on, out in the garden? Yeah, so the easiest way to do it is instead of using the castings, you know, the, the sort of like chocolate cake batter looking stuff, you dissolve that in water. So I'll take about a golf ball size of fresh worm castings, put it in like a half gallon jar uh, with water, and I just give it a really good shake like really, really, really hard. Shake, 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 shake. Um, and what is on the worm castings is that biology will come off in the water. The nutrients will get dissolved in the water. And there's also something super nerdy, but so worth going down a rabbit hole for anybody who wants to, is something called auto inducers, which go to YouTube, look up the TED talk on auto inducers and y'all, your mind will be blown. Um, too much to go into right now, but it basically you get those three things in the, the solution. And then I just strain it and I foliar feed it around the fire. I just spray it on the leaves. I foliar apply it around so the fire. Yep. 
But when it comes to seed sowing in particular, I, I do that with that vermicast extract where I just dissolve, dissolve it in. There's still a little like schmutz left for the record right. afterwards. It's not all gone. Um, but I dissolve that and then I just use that as the water to moisten the mix. So when you're going to make your blocks or for me and I'm going to fill my cell trays, we use that vermicast extract liquid to moisten the the soil. And then that's just immediately incorporated. As soon as the seed touches it, it's it, it's it's uh, exposed to all that microbiology. It's amazing. Um, and that's probably the easiest thing you guys can do. If all of this sounds really daunting and overwhelming, but you want to start one place, I would say start with using um, fresh worm castings to make a vermicast extract and then use that as your as your liquid for Watering. moistening the soil. Yep. And then you can use it to water thereafter. Um, I also spray it on seedlings later on. I also mix some of that kelp into that liquid, you know, like when, when I'm making the vermicast extract in the jar, I add a tablespoon of that powdered kelp product called maxi crop, and I just shake that around. Um, and so you've added, the kelp is in there now. I put a table or a teaspoon, sorry, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon of that um, liquid calcium, that WCA, the eggshell extract, I put that in there. Um, and then I also, if I'm going to use the LAB that we talked about, I put that in there. So basically, I just use all these inputs and I put them in the water that moistens the soil. And then that's, so it's actually not a lot of extra steps. It seems like it when you first hear about it. You get all the pieces put together mm -hmm. and have all yeah. the stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's it kind of is down um, for everybody listening who their heads network um, for that. And I'll include a link in the show notes to that as well. So, all right, Lisa, I, there's so many other things I bet I didn't ask you that I should have asked you about seed starting. Any final parting thoughts about seed starting that you wish you had known? You know, obviously, by the way, Lisa's got an amazing podcast, link in the show notes. You talk about seed starting in so many ways and so many formats. But is there anything that resonated today here after this conversation? Well, I think the thing that people need to remember, and, and it wasn't really obvious to me, is that it's science. And it's pretty simple. They need moisture, warmth, um, and some nutrients and light. And when you give them that, those pieces and people struggle and struggle. And I mean, I think even in all seed starting, not just soil blocking, people really struggle with the watering. That is the mm -hmm. biggest. I mean, most often we overwater, we rot stuff. We, I mean, plants are drowning even though they're sitting in water you can't see it they're drowning inside those blocks because they're constantly wet yeah so you just have to work on your technique and you will figure it out and stay simple and up and putting some icing on the cake you yeah. know and do a lot of these things um because i think people are just it's so hard i mean it's so hard for me sometimes to look back and think how we know so much now. I just forget how hard it was. And um, so we all have to walk that walk, right? Yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. And I'm so glad you mentioned the like soil moisture because that is how so many people kill seedlings early on. But Gosh. roots roots can't grow without oxygen. So many people exactly. don't understand that air is just as important, if not more important, maybe, to yeah. to roots growing as water is. Instead, we've always been sort of um, indoctrinated with the idea that plants need a lot of water. They need some water, but they also need air, lots and lots of air <laughs> in the soil. Yeah, I mean, I just am a big believer that in a 24-hour period, they need to be watered. They're moist. They're moist. They're getting drier they're dry overnight and they're ready for another drink the next morning you know you want that environment that creates absorption and it's warm enough that it dries out you know constant you can only grow algae and mold on soil with constant moisture and it's too cool usually too if that's and happening it's too cool yeah and i tell people it's that that moisture that algae and mold doesn't kill your seedling what created the algae and moisture is what is killing the sea. Yeah, the too What's much water. <laughs> I mean, a, a very common um, question I get is, my seedlings are just sitting there. It's almost always overwatering, too cool, 
anyway, yeah, we could talk for days. <laughs> we could, but everybody should tune into your into your Seed Talk podcast because that's a great place to get additional information about seed starting. But for now, Lisa, thank you for sharing your expertise here and listening to me ram- ramble on about some woo-woo things that maybe seem a little bit less scientific, but I promise there's science behind them. <laughs> so thank you so much. Okay, welcome back. I hope you soaked up some great bits of info there. I put links in the show notes to the books that were mentioned here and to the original No-Till Flowers podcast episode as well. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. That's all for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm-hmm.